So now we begin to look at chapter 31, Societies at a Crossroads. So this looks at a number of the places around the globe that we've visited a few times. So the Ottoman Empire, Russia, China, and Japan, and see how they deal with issues of imperialism, nationalism, international trade, and the growing power of Western Europe at this time. And how do they react? What are their changes? And how does this lead us into kind of the time frame of World War I in the early 1900s? So first we're going to look at the Ottoman Empire and Russia in this very first video. So... We have the first, we have the decline of the Ottoman Empire, also known, um, unfortunately, as the sick man of Europe, or the sick old man of Europe. Um, so we have to remember that the Ottoman Empire is this, as at one point, this massive Islamic empire um, that's expanded essentially almost all the way into Iran, into the Arabian Peninsula, through much of North Africa, into Egypt and the Sudan, and also into the Balkan regions of Europe, where they had conquered almost all the way up to Vienna. Um, hadn't gotten that far. They, they attacked Vienna twice, but weren't able to conquer it. So they were a very large empire that had kind of taken over the territory of the Byzantine Empire and a lot of the Islamic caliphates uh, in the kind of um, ending of the Mongol empires or the uh, Mongol Khanates uh, that had existed at that point in history. So they have a very wide, diverse population on top of the fact of a very large geographic space and had relied upon this group here known as the Janissaries, which were um, Christians taken out of the Balkan regions as tribute and turned and converted to Muslims who served in the military. And they, over time, gained a lot of power as the military force in terms of choosing who the next um, sultan of the Ottoman Empire was going to be. And they kind of restricted the growth and usage of new technologies and innovations that would have loosened and uh, weakened their own power. All right. Um, so we also have bureaucratic issues where more local landlords and uh, regional governors and um, bureaucrats are essentially holding back tax money and they're overtaxing uh, the local peoples throughout much of the empire, which leads to a lot of resentment and a lot of problems to pay for the military and other reforms um, that the Ottomans had maybe attempted to, to try. Um, they are kind of, again, the closest real non-Christian threat to mainland Europe, again, facing off oftentimes with, um, you know, the Italian city-states within the Austro-Hungarian Empire and also the expanding uh, Russian Empire as well. And so neither one had great feelings towards each other, but they both relied on each other also for trade. Um, because for Europe, before, you know, the, um, you know, expansion into and around Africa and into the Americas and oh, through, you know, the Indian Ocean trade to China, Essentially, they were still relying on the Silk Road, which ran right through the smack dab into the Ottoman Empire. And even after the sea trades, you know, got massive, they still relied on the Ottomans for a lot of trade throughout that part of the globe. Um, so they kind of are, there's kind of a, you know, we need each other kind of uh, system here. Kind of a little symbiotic relationship, but also a lot of tension that also existed. It's the center of Islam because it also holds on to Mecca as the holy site, as well as Medina and also Jerusalem are all under the control of the Ottoman Empire. So, other things that kind of explain the unfortunate decline, or maybe fortunate decline, depending on your perspective, of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, there is a growth of nationalism, again, coming back right out to the French Revolution and the Enlightenment. Um, you have nationalist movements that are kind of expanding throughout the Balkan region of the glo of uh, Europe at this point. So Greece is able to successfully launch its own independence movement and secede in 1830. Um, Serbia in 1867, and we'll re-mention Serbia when we get to World War I, um, and they're aided in, in many cases by Russia, as are a lot of Slavic people, so like hung Hungary, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, starting to try and put pressure on the Ottoman Empire to essentially earn their freedom and, you know, um, break away from the Muslim-controlled area in a fairly Christ fairly dominant Christian region. Um, in this case, being mostly Eastern or, or uh, Byzantine or Eastern Orthodox uh, Christian. Okay, and then we also have other groups like um, within Egypt, um, led by Muhammad Ali. No, not the boxer. Sorry for all those people out there. Okay. Um, also, he uh, you know essentially broke Egypt away from the Ottoman Empire. Didn't exactly. Um, secede, but essentially became a very strong state that actually threatened um, the Sultan and the rule of the main Ottoman Empire for a very long time in the 1800s. Okay, and all these are losses to Christian powers or related to Christian powers because Egypt is also going to be backed up and overtaken later by um, England. Okay, as we'll talk about with, uh, you know, when we get to the scramble for Africa and imperialism. Um, so yeah, there's also the expanding influence of Christianity due to trade, colonialism, imperialism, 
around the globe. So it's kind of like they are slowly being kind of pinched on and losing territory to Christian groups all around them, right? Who are also getting more and more wealth. They also have a trade and loan deficit because they're manufacturing European or they're importing manufactured or they're importing European manufactured goods. So guns, clothing, things of that nature. And they are exporting, you know, um, you know, their own stuff. <clears throat> But again, at not very great rates. Um, and so they don't make a whole lot of money. It's a very large trade deficit that's going on here. And so they're also, in many cases, uh, whenever they're trying to invest in new technologies, they have to do it on European loans. So that means that Europe has a tighter grasp on them. Right? So there's that struggle to pay off their debts, pay off the military, or pay for the military, their bureaucracies, again, due to you know, the issues we've kind of already talked about. Um, and then on top of that, when you're not able to pay your debts, you typically go into and have to, you know, uh, if you don't go into foreclosure, then people start taking or, you know, putting more uh, rights on you or, you know, saying, oh, we can get away with more stuff. So that's what we call capitulation and extraterritoriality treaties. So initially, the Ottoman Empire was very generous to foreign merchants by giving them the ability to sort of like, oh, well, if there's an issue between Christian merchants, we'll let them deal with it. Or between Jewish merchants, we'll let them deal with it. If it comes in contact with a Muslim merchant, well, then we're going to intercede. Um, and this had been very similar to what we'd seen in a number of different, you know, uh, Islamic, you know, areas historically throughout this entirety of the course. Um, so that, you know, had been extended again to, you know, other groups as well. Um, but now as they fall further into debt, they allowed the Europeans through more treaties and capitulations to say, ah, well, they don't, most Europeans don't have to obey any Ottoman laws. So essentially, if you're English, you just have to obey English law in the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Uh, they established tax exempt banks, so they're not paying taxes on goods that they're selling, on goods that they're producing, um, on, you know, trade and interest. Like none of that is being taxed. So um, the Ottomans are making less and less money. And then, you know, stuff that is sold to the Ottoman peoples. Um, you know, the Europeans can make tax money on. So the Ottoman Empire is definitely getting the short stick on all this stuff because they're in so much debt and reliance upon Europe just to stay afloat, right? And so kind of here's the largest extent of the Ottoman Empire, as we've seen. Um, and then here are the losses of their territories. So up through 1915, the beginning of World War One. Okay, you kind of see all these areas that are declared, you know, independence over the years, losses to Russia, states that have declared independence. Others have been taken by the Austro-Hungarian Empire or by the British. Um, and then over here is what they're going to lose following World War I. Okay. So, and part of that, um, the book, so I think the book mentions it or maybe a different source mentions it. Um, essentially, the only thing that the reason the, the Ottoman Empire survives is because this would offset the balance of power that Europe was trying to keep following, you know, Napoleon in 1815. And so when Russia begins to offset itself here in the Black Sea by taking more and more territory of the Ottoman Empire and essentially become like the, you know, rulers of the Ottoman Empire without actually ruling over it, that's when the French and British step in and say, yeah, no, we got to leave this thing afloat in order to prevent Russia from becoming too powerful, All right? Which we will, again, talk about in a little bit. So in terms of attempts at reform or becoming more Western like Russia had, been trying to do as well as parts of Latin America at this point. Okay, within the military, okay, trained by Europeans, or they begin to train in the European style with European leaders, uh, send many of them to European schools, or you know, start using those techniques in their own schools, um, for use of more modern weapons, and they eventually, because of the Janissaries' staunch resistance and actually killing one of the emperors and many of his descendants are they themselves killed by essentially a private army in 1826 and replaced by a more European looking, more European trained, more European style military as shown in that image. Okay. This also follows the, what's known as the Tanzimat or reorganization era that lasts for about 45 ish years and then a little bit longer than that. Um, that follows again at your enlightenment and European ideals for how do we modernize our country? So some of the things that are put in with the Tanzimat, Free education based on European schools, which also limits the influence of the ulama or the religious scholars, okay? Which, as we know, within any Islamic country at this point is very massive and have a lot of influence, okay? Um, they change the laws away from Islam and more towards the Napoleonic European code to, again, make themselves more, appear more Western and to essentially um, make it easier to manage and to keep people treated fairly. Um, 
This includes public trials, uh, right to privacy, and equality for the law for all Muslims, for all Ottomans, not just Muslims. So Christians and Jews are now given full political um, rights as any given Muslim throughout the Ottoman Empire would, which again will anger um, a lot of the religious conservatives within the empire. Okay, so other things that happen. Okay, they also face opposition from minority leaders who risk losing power, from the bureaucrats who are losing tax money, and those who again want more local autonomy. Think the nationalist groups that all exist here because the Ottoman Empire is more than just Turkey. It has so many different ethnic groups and nationalities that are existing in there. All right. Um, so the Young Turk Party, as we'll see that image down here, okay, these gentlemen here, again, more Western style and mixture of dress and look um, with more Ottoman style, okay, um, eventually inspires a military coup in 1908, 1909, and form a new government where the Sultan does exist but has no real power. They have a parliament and, again, has become more and more secular and less of a Muslim-controlled country. It's still Muslim-dominated. But religion is playing less and less of a factor, which is in very stark contrast to Muslim, a lot of Muslim-led countries today, where, and, or that have continued through where the religion is still a very large part of society. Okay. So some of the other reforms, again, to make it more modern, more in style with industrialization in European ways. Okay. More roads, railroads, telegraph line um, to improve communication, trade, and control throughout the empire, especially as they're losing territory, it makes it more compact, easier to spread information, move troops, move goods and products, and communicate throughout the entirety of the empire. It doesn't stem the losses in war as they continually lose more and more territory, as we saw. Um, and the empire will itself collapse and just turn into, or was it the main part of the empire turns into just the you know nation state we now know as Turkey. Um, but it will still have strong ties to both Islam and also to the West or in Europe, um, even to today where they are a part of NATO and trying to join, if not have already joined the European Union. So trying to face, you know, two sides of the world. So that first video, we're, I know I said Russia, but we will just do that and save it for a second video all of its own. So that covers kind of the sick old man of Europe known as the Ottoman Empire and the reasons for the struggles they go through, attempts at reform, but still doesn't stem the losses that they will be facing and the struggles they're going with in, in control or trying to compete with Europe, who still essentially dominates them at this point in time.